Hello, I'm beginning this evening's presentation with an interview with Dr. Edward Edinger, which I discovered uh, only last week, and I took it upon myself um, to transcribe it. So I'm going to start that interview off and just play a couple of excerpts. It's an hour long, but I'm only going to play a few minutes of it here at the beginning. Um, and so I'm going to start, start it off as a way to um, pass some time uh, until a few more people come aboard, which should be in the next few minutes. Uh, so here are the first uh, few segments of the Edinger Lecture. One reason uh, apparently that some of Jung's books are difficult to follow is that his thinking was so far ahead of our own. Would you say that much of your work has the goal of rendering more understandable Jung's religious message understood broadly? I think of myself as a, as a mediator between Jung and, and a wider, wider audience. Uh, Jung is this gigantic presence uh, that is profoundly intimidating to, to all of us little ones. And we're, we're all little ones in comparison to him. The, uh, I've been studying Jung for, uh, as, as my major, major life endeavor for 40 years. And uh, the more I study him, the more impressed I am by his magnitude. And uh, <clears throat> the more I can understand why so many people uh, don't want to get anywhere, anywhere near him, because they, uh, it's, uh, it's just too painful to uh, experience one com one's comparative smallness uh, in comparison to, to such, a, such a massive uh, entity. Uh, and uh, often I think uh, it's a sound instinct of self-preservation that keeps people away from, from Jung. Okay, I'm going to move this on to a little later in the interview, um, which is uh, Dr. Edinger's observations about uh, Dr. Jung and religion. I'm trying to, uh, to make it a little easier to, uh, to relate to Jung by by, by mediating. What does Jungian psychology have to do with religion? <clears throat> everything. Every, everything. Uh, you see, Jung has demonstrated that The religious function resides in the psyche, and is a integral part of uh, of human psychology. <clears throat> and that just means that the that the ego, in order to be healthy, needs to have a living connection to uh, a transpersonal center. That's uh, there are two etymologies uh, for the word religion. Um, one etymology emphasizes that it means linking back. The idea then would be that the, that the religious uh, function <coughs> links the ego back uh, to, its, to its origin to its background, to the, to the larger entity 
that it came from. <coughs> the, the other etymology of religion that uh, Jung really preferred, actually, was that the, that the word, the word re religio means the opposite of the root of the word neglect. Uh, so that religio means the careful consideration of the background of one's life. Uh, the opposite of neglecting the background of, one, of one's life. And Jung actually preferred that association, although he, he acknowledged the importance of the, of the other one, which I think uh, uh, goes back to Augustine. <clears throat> but the point is that uh, the human psyche has a religious function in both senses, a, a need to link back and a need to give Careful, careful consideration to uh, the, the, the source of, of his being. And the religious process then is, is one in which the ego has a living organic connection to a larger whole. And that, of course, is the function that the traditional religions have always served. Uh, they've they've done it by by the the collective structure and the the dogmatic formulations and their the whole concept of, of God and man's relation to God that they provide the believer they've they've uh, given uh, given the individual a, a religious container in in which he has the sense of uh, being connected to the larger whole now, Modern man, uh, especially those, the, the creative minority of modern man, has lost that, uh, that connection uh, provided by the traditional religions because uh, they're too concrete. They, they, haven't, they haven't kept pace with, uh, with the modern man's mental, mental development. So they're not, they're not in tune with modern categories of understanding. Uh, so the, the great service that Jung has performed has, by, by his discovery of the, of the collective unconscious and the, and the archetypes and the, and the self, he's, he's penetrated to the psychological source and basis that underlies all the world religions. And uh, thereby, he's verified and redeemed for modern consciousness the validity and reality of uh, the re religious operations as, as they express themselves in all religions. Uh, that's been achieved, and uh, I don't think we can uh, appreciate the, the magnitude of that achievement because uh, what it means is that the the psychological basis has been laid for the realization of a unified world. Uh, we, we've got the basis now for a unification of, of all the uh, factional divisions uh, among the world religions. Uh, and uh, uh, when, once that achieved, is achieved, uh, I think, uh, political unification uh, is bound to follow. It's been accomplished. One man has done it. I wish I could communicate uh, the fact that I, that I see so, so clearly uh, concerning Jung's discovery uh, of, the, of the basis of all the world's religions. He's achieved uh, by this discovery, the, the psychological basis for the unification of the world. Uh, it, it's really a, a pitiful sight to, to see the, uh, the world split up into these uh, separate warring fragments uh, of, uh, 
religious identifications, of nationalistic identifications, of ethnic identifications, all, all at war with one another. They're, they're all operating out of the energies of connection with the same, with the same transpersonal uh, image of wholeness. They are all operating out of their connection to, to deity, to the self, as it is uh, constellated and perceived within their, their, their local context, religious or nationalistic context. It's the same, it's the same psychic self. Uh, and what Jung has done has, has penetrated to, to that source. Uh, uh, that's the paradoxical God that he talks, that he talks about. He's seen it. And once he's seen it, it, it can then no longer sp split up into these, these various uh, ethnic and, and religious factions and fight against itself. Uh, one human being has uh, seen the, the back of God, so to speak. So that means then that uh, He's going to be eventually unified, and uh, the uh, the world will be unified politically sooner or later, uh, as a as an inev inevitable consequence of of that uh, that event of human consciousness. Jung has taught us that the leading idea of a new religion will come from the symbolism of the religion that preceded it. Applied to modern times, this means that the leading idea of the era that we are now entering will be based on the Judeo-Christian myth. Do you have a comment on this? Yes, I do. It leads us right in to uh, a, a major uh, pronouncement that Jung makes in his late work, uh, especially <clears throat> in answer to Job, where he speaks about uh, the, the new mode of existence is, is to be what, what he calls continuing incarnation. Now that requires some explanation, because I think very few people will We'll, we'll get right away just what he means by continuing incarnation. Um, you see, the, the central image of the uh, Judeo-Christian myth is that uh, Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, according to Jung, because uh, he had an encounter with Job, was obliged to incarnate. And so he, he's born in the form of his son as a human being in Jesus Christ. That's the basic uh, image of the, of the total Judeo-Christian myth. Uh, and that's the issue that uh, Christianity has picked up and, and elaborated, uh, and that uh, Judaism has, has declined to pick up. Uh, Christianity is, is really uh, just a, a Jewish heresy that has uh, mushroomed so much that it's, uh, uh, that it's sort of uh, obscured its, uh, its mother, but uh, uh, the the Jewish uh, scriptures and the Christian sh scriptures uh, share the same idea of a divine son, uh, but the difference between them is that uh, the Jews think he's, uh, his coming is going to be in the future, and the Christians think he's already come. Uh, but the, the, the basic idea is the same. And, uh, 
Jung's point is that that uh, image of the incarnation of deity in a human being, which was symbolically manifested in Christ, uh, is now to be empirically realized in a few individuals who are able to uh, go through the process of individuation, because uh, he, he, um, uh, he considers that the individuation process to, to be equivalent to the symbolic imagery of the uh, incarnation of, uh, <clears throat> of God in the human being. Uh, what, <clears throat> what that means psychologically, what that means psychologically is that uh, the ego, in the process of establishing a conscious, living relationship with the self, becomes the, the, the ground, so to speak, for the incarnation of deity. As Jung puts it the, someplace, uh, the ego is the stable in which the Christ child is born. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this symbolism has now become uh, available for empirical psychological understanding. It no longer has to be worshipped as a metaphysical hypostasis which uh, is the way it, way it appears uh, in, in projection, so to speak, in, uh, in metaphysical or theological projection when it's, uh, when it's worshipped as a, as a religious image. It's not in, in such a form, it's not yet uh, realized as a, a psychic reality, as, a, as, as an aspect of uh, psychological experience. So that's, um, that's what Jung has achieved. He's, he's achieved uh, in his own life uh, the incarnation of deity. Uh, and uh, the way he modestly puts it, uh, there are, uh, uh, there's now the opportunity for uh, many to do likewise. Uh, he describes that at the, uh, at the conclusion of the uh, <clears throat> answer to Job. He puts it so well that I'd like to, uh, to read it. It's the, uh, it's the final paragraph uh, of, Jung, of Jung's answer to Job. Answer to Job. Uh, He's talking about the relation between the ego and the self, and he says that a reciprocal action is established when the uh, ego and the self are consciously related. A reciprocal action between two relatively autonomous factors, which compels us when describing and explaining the processes to present sometimes the one and sometimes the other factor as the acting subject even when God becomes man. The Christian solution has hitherto avoided this difficulty by recognizing Christ as the one and only God-man. But the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the third divine person in man, brings about a Christification of many. That's the... That's the... Uh, phrase I wanted to get to. Uh, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the third divine person in man, brings about a Christification of many. Now, if I translate that, uh, that symbolic imagery into, uh, into banal uh, psychological terms, then I would say uh, 
the achievement of consciousness of the ego self axis, the connecting factor between the ego and the self, uh, in parentheses, the Holy Ghost, <coughs> brings about a realization that the ego is manifesting in its life a transpersonal purpose and meaning. Uh, that's what's meant by the symbolic imagery of the incarnation of God in man through the agency of the Holy Ghost. Uh, now, <clears throat> that's hard to grasp, but with so much uh, of, uh, of Jung's writings, I think the way to, to, uh, to go at it is to read the relevant passages. That's why I point to the last paragraph of Answer Job, to read the relevant passages over and over and over again, uh, because they, they really have the quality of Scripture. Uh, Jung is speaking from a consciousness that transcends that of all of, all of us. And therefore, we, we must read what he has to communicate over and over again, and then it begins to dawn on us just what he means. Okay, um, I'm going to cut the video off at this point. Um, and uh, let me get myself back on the screen. Um, so, um, I'm going to have to move this camera a little bit because I wasn't able to see the comments that were coming up. And uh, as you no, no doubt know, I think this uh, interview was pretty profound um, and uh, even though I thought that I would uh, speak to Thomas Arst's essay this evening which I may still do I um, I definitely wanted to come back to this one and I see I've uh, it's related to at least Jerome many people are still looking and projecting outside and not turning inward to see the reflection and I think that that's quite true Jer Jerome I you know obviously that's what religion sells um, you know religion wants to sell God that who's out there and um, uh, and then they want to be the intermediary to this invisible magical person who's out who's out there and and uh, um, and it's one doesn't get a religious experience by doing doing that um, by letting the uh, religions be the intermediary um, and the way that you do get have an uh, religious experience in my view and I have some experience with this is that you have to look inside um, as dr. Jung said he who looks outside dreams he who looks inside awakens and um, there is certainly this part of us which dr. Jung called the sir self um, Dr. Edinger also called it the greater personality. It's also been called very often the God image. Um, it is the deepest um, archetype in the human psyche. And in this, um, in this interview later on, uh, Dr. Jaffe asks um, Dr. Edinger, um, how, how do you describe Jung? And he says, well, he's a scientist. He's a scientist of depth psychology. And what he, and his point was that you can't use the traditional methods, uh, the traditional scientific methods 
to research uh, depth psychology because the traditional methods always want to solve for X or something like that. I mean, that's a simplistic way of saying it, but they always want to rule out uh, a lot of factors. And uh, with the self, you can't do that. You have to uh, experience the whole person. And, um, and the method of doing it is in, relates to the psyche. There are psychic facts, and they don't have the kind of material form that uh, scientists are used to looking at. I heard uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about brain activity and how you could hook up electrodes and you could see how different chemicals were moving around in the brain. Well, that doesn't tell you a thing, not a thing, uh, about what's happening in the psyche. And, uh, and what's happening in the psyche is not only uh, in each one of us, but it's also in the collective unconscious, which is one of the factors that Dr. Jung proved uh, during his lifetime. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Red Book and uh, his, his actual experience be, because um, Dr. Jung had a long series of visions, five years worth. And so far, as I understand it, we only have access to about 50% of what he actually um, gave us or what, what he actually wrote down in his black books. This is according to Sono Shamdasani, who is the editor of the Red Book. And he had to select the key passages that he thought should go out in the first folio version. But he apparently is also working on the black books, of which I understand there's seven or eight of them. And, um, and we might expect quite a bit more. Dr. Jung left a huge quantity of writing and uh, only a small portion of it has actually come up even though his collected works are 20 volumes. Um, but those actually sort of amount to a, a, uh, a summary of his overall work. But um, I was told by James Hollis that there are still something like 80,000 letters that haven't surfaced. And of course, if you know anything about Dr. Jung's work, um, you'll know that we know very little about what was going on in his life and his writing uh, between about 1936 and uh, 1946. Uh, during, during that period, he was doing the Zarathustra letters, or I'm sorry, the Zarathustra um, lectures, uh, which itself uh, is huge. Um, and the, I don't think those lectures are even in uh, the collected works. And uh, they're available, um, and they're available for sale on Amazon and places. And before uh, Zarathustra, he did an another five-year seminar on, um, on uh, visioning, and he had uh, Christina Morgan's visions. But I, know, I don't know too much about that visioning seminar, but I do know about the Zarathustra because I started to work with it and it's 86 lectures and each of the lectures is 10 to 20 pages long in in my printouts that I have. Uh, I have a thick binder where I've printed these things out and um, and considering that Nietzsche's book Thus Spake Zarathustra is only 200 pages long. 
uh, the lectures are 1600 pages long uh, so you can see that it's quite a bit more complicated so um, the reason that answer to Joe becomes a, a big deal in Jungian psychology part of the reason is because um, Job was having visions, and in the last two days I've posted um, my reading of Dr. Edinger's book called Encounter with the Self, which Dr. Yo Dr. Edinger called his portable psychological hour. Actually, it took me about an hour and 15 minutes in the edited version of my videos to read it, um, but in that, uh, you can look at the 22 engravings by William Blake, uh, which uh, he did in 1825. And uh, he basically described in his engravings the psychological events that were going on in Job's visions. Um, and so where Dr. Jung and the theologians probably would disagree, uh, I listened to a video by a man named Bishop Barron today, who apparently is a Catholic bishop, and um, he wants to believe that things were physically true in the material world. And what Dr. Edinger has done is analyze the Job story at using William Blake's etchings as an example um, to follow the story through and explain what was going on in the psyche of this man Job. And so, the, so you can find my reading uh, now on the YouTube channel. I just posted part two of that um, reading uh, a couple of hours ago, so you won't have seen it yet. But um, it's quite interesting uh, to go through Dr. Edinger's analysis and see what he's talking about. And uh, so, for example, when Job has false comforters that come to him, uh, to say, well, maybe it was your fault type thing. Uh, Dr. Edinger is explaining to us that those are really shadow figures who were saying, oh, you're not worth anything, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. And we've all experienced that part of our psyche that tells us we're not what we hope we are or we think we are, perhaps. Um, and so... Uh, if you read and listen to Dr. Edinger's full lecture, his full interview there, uh, you'll see that uh, Dr. Jung considered his experiment, his 1912, 1913, I'm sorry, 1913 to 1918 visioning experiment as an actual psychological experiment on himself. And then he reconfirmed his findings that he found um, as a scientist with his patients as a medical doctor. And he always considered himself as writing uh, with the sense of responsibility of a medical doctor. And so what he found and proved um, scientifically is that these archetypes actually are in the psyche. And so then if you understand that context and the context of what was going on in the visioning in Dr. Jung's visioning, where he was envisioning physical entities coming to him and talking to him, uh, and interacting with him, conversing with him throughout this entire period, um, you understand that he, he considered that as comparable to the things that happened to Job or happened to Jacob at the, at the river uh, 
Javik, I think, and um, happened to Paul, happened to uh, Moses with Al Kidder in uh, Shura 18 of the Quran. Um, all those things, if you, if you go to the uh, combination of the transcript and the video, which is uh, linked uh, in this chat, at the top of this chat, uh, you will also find to the right side of the screen, that's uh, the website that I've managed since 2010, and I'm the sole curator of it. And so you can blame me for anything you find there, essentially. Um, but anyway, uh, you'll see that about uh, a quarter of the way down the page, there's a tab on the right column for Edinger. And in that tab, there are links to two very important essays that are available, or I'm, I'm sorry, they were um, lectures that he gave at the San Diego, San Diego Friends of Jung one in 1984 and one in 1988. Um, they are only audio. Uh, you'll find the audios there linked and they're also available on YouTube. But uh, some months ago, about a year and a half ago now, uh, I transcribed both of those lectures as well. And one of them is called um, uh, encounters with the greater personality in which Dr. Edinger talks about other encounters with the self and uh, the other one is called um, uh, individuation a myth for modern man and so if you read his the recently available interview plus those two you're going to know a lot about not only Jungian psychology, but also about Edward Edinger's perspective. Um, so uh, let me just stop for any comments here before I go on. Uh, yeah, Miles says, um, I sensed scripture in the writing of the supreme meaning, uh, very definitely. Um, and uh, you know, Dr. Young, I, I presume that you've seen um, the um, the Red Book or the images from the Red Book, and you see with what great care Dr. Young put that together. Um, the visioning period lasted five years, but he worked on the Red Book and the visions and the words that came out. Uh, for 16 years. He was only taken away from it when Richard Wilhelm uh, came back from China and asked him uh, to work on The Secret of the Golden Flower, which is a Chinese alchemical text. And when he saw that, he realized that um, alchemy was a concept that had been common both in China and uh, in medieval Europe. And he had been studying alchemy since uh, the late 19 teens. And, but he wasn't sure what he had. I mean, he literally spent about a decade uh, creating a lexicon of alchemy because he was trying to put together all these Latin words that were in these old alchemical texts with the symbols that they were showing. And he ultimately put together a lexicon that, I don't recall, it was at least 10,000 words. It might have been 20,000 uh, words and phrases that the alchemists used. It was a huge number, and he worked on that for, 20, er, for 10 years. Uh, but he had nothing to connect it up to tell him, you know, is he right? And when Wilhelm came with the secret of the golden flower and he saw how much it paralleled what he was doing, then he had the confirmation he needed to start really researching alchemy. And uh, in his later work, uh, after 1928, he in fact wrote um, at least three major 
works on alchemy. Um, so let me... Uh, so a anyway, the, the point I was making to Miles is that um, he was taking very great care in putting this book together, even though he never approved it to be released to the public um, during his lifetime. Uh, and that's a story unto itself where Sonu Shamdasani decided it was time to come out and he uh, found pieces of it in the Yale library and so he went to the heirs of C.G. Young and said look this is going to come out one way or another partially or fully so I would appreciate it if I would have the opportunity to actually look at the real red book which was in a bag vault in Zurich and um, and so they agreed and so what we have the main folio volume of the red book uh, is uh, quite a remarkable piece and it is a um, it's a facsimile copy of the actual images that Dr. Young put together Okay, so religious jumped all over Pastor Michael Walrond, who suggested other ways would be com compatible with both J Jesus and God. Uh, remember, it's his way, not ours. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the point, that Dr. Young says that what he found uh, comports with every religion and um, you know we can expect that that theologians are going to resist I mean if we look at a man like uh, uh, the Reverend Paul Vanderclay I mean he's obviously a very in intelligent and a very interested individual but he's been um, doing his work as a pastor in a traditional way for probably 30 years and so all of a sudden he's presented with this these ideas which are completely new to him and he's finding them uh, fascinating but he doesn't um, he doesn't know what to say about them yet and he can't get his mind around them yet um, and uh, I think he hasn't understood because uh, what happens is that people tend to want to take Jung's work and compare it as equals with other with philosophers or or whatever. And um, as Dr. as Dr. Edinger said, uh, what Jung found is the source of philosophy of all kinds but it is not philosophy. It is uh, empirically proven what Dr. Jung found, not only in himself, but in his patients. And you can believe that or not, but um, I think that some of the things that uh, Dr. Edinger said in this interview uh, amount to uh, things that you can't unring the bell. You know, as, a, as an attorney, <laughs> we often say, well, you, you say something outrageous in front of the jury. The other side says, objection. The, the judge says, uh, sustained. So uh, you're, you're, whatever you said is supposed to be stricken from the record. But if the jury heard it, you can't unring the bell. They, they've heard it. And if people start to understand uh, what it is that they were saying, Dr. Young and Dr. Edinger for that matter, um, then uh, you start to see that everything about religions on a global basis has to change. And it, it may take hundreds of years. Dr. Young thought it was going to take 600 years, and I think Edinger also thought that, and he died in 1998. So that was only three years after the World Wide Web really got going. He didn't really understand the potential of it. Uh, but I believe that these changes are going to come uh, much faster 
much faster than um, than people think. I, I'm not saying it's going to be in my lifetime. Uh, I'd like to see a beginning of it. I hope I'm a beginning of it. And, you know, by having this um, website, I now realize that the YouTube channel has now been viewed by 160 countries, from 160 countries. And, of course, the United States is about 50% of that, and of the uh, Internet as a whole. Um, but it's being viewed all over the world. And um, one thing I do agree with uh, the anonymous movement about is you can't kill an idea. Once an idea starts to percolate through the system, it's going to find its uh, home, which is more or less uh, what an archetype does. Once an archetype starts and starts to uh, execute its program, it doesn't stop. It's going to keep going. Once it gets constellated, it keeps going. And um, so Jerome says, let's see. Jerome says, uh, Divine Number Two was speaking through Young Number One personality. Yes, and uh, Dr. Edinger says later in this interview uh, that that's a shortcoming. It's a it's a problem because the ego is contained within the self, and it's a part of it, and as such it can't really make an objective judgment about it. And also, if it looks at the self, the self changes in all of us. And, um, and differently in each one of us, as a matter of fact. So it's something like um, with uh, photons, uh, with light is either a photon or a wave, and it depends on how the, the observer looks at it. Uh, whether it's a photon or a wave, it's not both. And physicists can't explain that, but that's the same sort of difficulty that exists in um, understanding what we're talking about. But, and that's where there's room for metaphysics still, of course, uh, because, um, you know, things that you can't, uh, prove in a physical scientific method basis solving for X then people can put all kinds of ideas on it and obviously I do that I acknowledge that I do that I, and um, I um, I just hope that I give people enough hooks in their psyche so that they then go out and research it for themselves. And um, Dr. Edinger in this interview uh, was quite, um, how should I say, pessimistic because he was predicting all kinds of catastrophes ahead. And he was doing that in 1994, so it was before even the uh, Oklahoma City bombing. and. It, and he died, he never saw 9-11 or the wars in the early part of this century, uh, nor what's been going on in our politics for the last 20 years. And so he was really attuned to it um, at the collective unconscious level, and he knew it was coming. And he said, it, it's going to be a terrible time. And I don't think that what we've experienced so far is necessarily <laughs> enough of a terrible time yet. But one, one of the things he's, one thing he says is that when a terrible time comes up like that, then people revert to tribalism and they become more primitive. And of course, we've seen that in our societies around the world. And he said that he hoped that some people who could maintain, retain their consciousness um, would then be able um, to 
look around and look for solutions and then find Jung and start to try to apply some of his ideas. Well, is that what's happening right now? I don't know. I mean, obviously, uh, Dr. Jung has gotten uh, very much more popular and more uh, of greater interest to people. I know a friend of mine, uh, Louis LaFontaine, operates the Carl Jung Depth Psychology page on Facebook. And when I joined it, it had about 4,000 members. That was in 2005. It now has over 62,000 members. And so, um, you know, not all of those people are extremely active in uh, Jungian psychology. I mean, there's a lot of people, I'm sure, that are just reading quotes and memes uh, from Dr. Jung's work, but that's a start. And uh, I have to admit that you know, it's taken me 30 years to get to the point where I am now. I mean, I literally started to study Dr. Young's work in 1987, and it wasn't until around 2004 or 5 that I really started to get a handle on it. Um, and uh, it was only when the Red Book came out and I realized that I had had such an experience, that an experience that I had in 1993 was actually comparable <laughs> to the Red Book period that Dr. Jung went through. Then I really started to get interested because I really wanted to understand what was going on at that time. Uh, and, um, and I think I've pretty much grokked it at this point, but I mean, reasonable men can differ on that. Uh, let's see. Um, Jerome says, the web has the power to unite us, and hopefully Jung's message will arrive quicker than 600 years. Absolutely. Clark says, the web has given people uh, the media, usual, who the media usually ignores, a voice, and they try to cover up and repress what they say instead of accepting this is how things will work from now on. Um, this is definitely how things are going to work from now on unless um, some huge catastrophe takes place. Clark says, uh, the ideas of most people do not fit in a simple box and now the system cannot find a way to get people back in the box. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I've had uh, quite a few young people um, come to me, um, they tend to be in their early 30s, and they want to describe something that's happened to them, and then uh, they want me to tell them wh whether they're going crazy. And of course, I have to say immediately, and I do say to you now, uh, I'm not a mental health professional, and uh, nothing that I say in a Q&A or any other session uh, can be considered mental health advice. However, I do um, then tell them what I think in the context of what I know from Dr. Jung's oeuvre. And in every case, um, those people have been having uh, a spontaneous experience, very much like the one I had. And of course, in 1993, I was in the very rudimentary stages of studying Dr. Jung's work, and even though it was relevant to what happened to me, um, it was, um, uh, you know, it happened to me as a non-psychologist and as a non-expert Jungian, and so I had no clue what was going on. and. Um, you know, fortunately, I had by that time a large enough ego uh, so that uh, I could maintain my consciousness and, and not fall into uh, some sort of uh, uh, mental health problem, which can happen. And so uh, if you're watching this, uh, this, this is a real warning that as you look at these issues, especially these issues of archetype, and get into them more in more depth, um, 
these sorts of psychogenic experiences can start to happen because the self realizes that it is being looked at and it starts to communicate with you and I can't predict nobody can predict how that will happen uh, in my case it happened because uh, my wife was given a book called Women Who Run With the Wolves by a Jungian analyst named Clarissa Pinkola Estes and that was a bestseller for a couple of years uh, starting in 1993, I believe, and um, my mother gave my wife this book for Christmas, and it was sitting there under the Christmas tree, and on the day after Christmas, I picked it up, and I wouldn't put it down for two days. I said, you can't have it. <laughs> it's my wife, and, uh, and what happened was that after I read um, these various fairy tales and stories that is what the substance of that book was, uh, that's when my psychogenic experience, my eight month one, um, occurred. And it was, I'm sure it was constellated because I was studying Jungian psychology. Uh, so that's what individuation is about and you if it starts for you then you have to hold on uh, it's it's not necessarily easy um, i was reading something today which i wanted to share but i don't have it right at hand right now but someone said that everybody thinks that uh, the things in the psyche are all uh, nice fairy tale type things and uh, they don't realize that there are dragons too and snakes down there and um, and so those things can start coming up too and so what I would urge you to do is if you have a dream or a vision where a snake comes to comes up uh, I would say uh, try to talk to it <laughs> and <laughs> see if it has something to say to you uh, because uh, that's what Dr. Jung did and he did have a, a black snake uh, that came along with uh, Philemon and uh, Salome in his early visions um, and um, so anyway what I wanted to say then was okay so we've pegged the red book as this visioning period sort of a a comparable visioning period to what Job went through and then Dr. Jung spent the next 30 or so years um, trying to work it out what it meant from a scientific point of view also by looking at his own clients his own patients in his own clinic and um, during his heart attack period when he had a near-death experience um, he realized that he needed to write sort of a summary of it that people could understand and so that's when he wrote Ion and uh, so here's Ion as most of you probably know I've been reading Ion uh, into the channel um, I can only do so much. <laughs> I got so interested in Edinger again because of the interviews that I decided um, to read his book, his uh, portable analytic hour, Encounter with the Self, uh, on Saturday. And uh, it was two hours of reading, but at the end of two hours of reading, my throat was uh, giving up. <laughs> and so I could only do so much. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Jerome, I, I do agree that um, Peterson is helpful, okay? He's, he's offering handrails. Um, I'm a little bit troubled that he's a bit too much toward the logos and maybe that's true of all university professors uh, because you know they're feeding you a lot of facts none of which 
are going to be very relevant in your actual life. I mean, uh, I went to a liberal arts college and I cannot, I mean, it was a very good liberal arts college, Hamilton College, but um, I can't say that there's anything uh, that I actually learned in college that I ever used. And actually the same is true of business school. I mean, uh, my business school was 15 courses in statistics by different names, but uh, once I went out in business, I never had a a population, a statistical population big enough to run any regressions that I learned how to do during business school. And so um, all those things are kind of logos, but you have to go out in business and that's, and that's life and that's Eros, that's um, going out and getting some experience and knowing what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, I've had a I've had a very long career, thankfully, uh, that has been very varied. So I spent 23 years in the U.S. Marine Corps where, um, you know, a rule is a rule and everything has to be just so. Um, and I was able to do that through uh, the rank of lieutenant colonel. And um, so you can do it. It's not my preferred uh, psychological type, but nonetheless, it's, it can be done uh, even if it's not your preferred psychological type because you're trained to do it and you learn all the rules and then you obey all the rules. Um, and uh, the people that don't, um, you know, there's an apocryphal story. I can't say it's true from my own experience directly. Um, but there's an apocryphal story that um, in a firefight, uh, the average life expectancy of a second lieutenant is 15 seconds. And the reason for that is that the second lieutenant gets a bullet in the back of his head from his sergeants who don't trust him who, because of his arrogance, because second lieutenants all think that they're God's gift to the world are maybe not all, I wouldn't say I did, but uh, that's because I grew up in the military, so I knew how to respect staff NCOs from the time I was knee-high to a grasshopper. Um, but most people who become Marine Corps officers have no, none of that experience, and they don't know uh, that you know those sergeants are going to keep them alive. And... Um, you know, as, and you, that only, you only learn that by experience. And, and so um, my roommate from the basic school, we were both second lieutenants, and he was like my big brother, but he went to Vietnam, and five months later he was dead. Um, and uh, how he was dead, I don't know, but um, I mean, I've heard stories, but I don't really know. And um, uh, so we all have experiences that are defeats of some sort, and that's what the Job archetype is, the Job archetype of contest, defeat, lamentation, and rebirth. If you go through that cycle many times in your lifetime, then uh, you're going to strengthen your ego. And so in my case, when... I had my psychogenic experience. I had already been through a lot of things and um, and therefore uh, I had a strong enough ego to hold on even though I was having this experience which lasted eight months. Um, let's see. Uh, Clark says, Young works because there are very few universi universals his ideas can exist in frames that don't fit into tribal identities. I agree with that. Uh, and uh, as Edinger says in this interview, the problem with all 
systems is that they tend to get too sclerotic, they tend to get too rigid, and they don't have any room uh, for creativity. And when that happens, then uh, the self emerges and it breaks through the it breaks through all the rules. It starts to break through the rules, and so you know although uh, the Ten Commandments are n a nice idea, uh, there sure is a lot of adultery out there in the world, for example, and um, and so on. And although we've uh, pretended that we don't have child sacrifice anymore. Um, you know, I would say, what was what were those 58,000 young people that we uh, sacrificed in the Vietnam War? You know, what was that for? Uh, we should have known better. You know, all I, Clark says, all I can recall from last night's dream was a snake moving under the leaves. Well, um, you know, if you have a dream that has a dangerous element in it, you want to be wary of that dangerous element because it may in fact be dangerous. I don't mean to say that you can just walk up to any snake and talk to him <laughs> in a dream or in a vision. Uh, so please don't do that. Um, but uh, you can also uh, attempt to interact with it because that snake represents some complex in your psyche that maybe you need to either understand it as a symbol of something um, or, um, you know, actually communicate with it. But whether you communicate with it is has to be decided by your ego mind. You know, because your yourself, uh, your unconscious, um, was uh, was issued the day you were born, and it doesn't have to live in the twenty first century. You do, and so the the point, one of the key points about the role of the ego, is to uh, put morality and uh, common sense on your crazy ideas. I mean, we all have crazy ideas and I don't have to go into it. You know, people shouldn't throw stones, but uh, the reality is that we all have crazy ideas. And then you have to decide whether you want to bring your crazy idea into your physical life as opposed to letting it operate in your psyche for whatever purpose it has. Um, and um, so anyway, uh, what Dr. Jung did after his heart attack period, when he had a near-death experience, was he uh, wrote Ion, and that really put the structure uh, of the psyche as he was seeing it at that time, and especially the first four chapters. And those four chapters, um, I have completed reading, and so I urge you to uh, listen to those, plus uh, Dr. Edinger's commentary on those, and also uh, pay attention to Dr. Edinger's um, commentary at the beginning of the ION playlist, because uh, he says some very valuable things uh, in, the, in the preface and in the introduction uh, to ION. Uh, let's see. Lishan says, in Ethiopian Orthodox, fasting is believed to break down ego to discipline to body as well uh, and make it submit to the spiritual. Um, I'm sure that that's true, Lihan. Uh, or it's it's late Lishan. Um, you know, I have um, I have a lot of friends in the Muslim world. I've been uh, in the Muslim world many times during Ramadan and uh, I know how devout my Muslim friends are uh, and they're always uh, incredibly respectful and um, you know I think that the world would be better if uh, we all prayed five times a day because what you're doing 
when you're praying is communicating to yourself, to that God image. Um, and, um, and so whether you meditate or pray or whatever you do, uh, those are ways to break through, or not break through, but um, have things come through that are useful to you. And um, so, you know, while I'm not a big prayer personally, and I, I'm an occasional meditator, uh, I go to a Buddhist meditation class once a week when when my ankle is working, I have another week and a half to go on my ankle, <laughs> and hopefully I'll be able to drive again. Um, but anyway, um, the you know when I can, I do go to this Buddhist meditation class, which is a bunch of non-Jungian psychologists, <laughs> and uh, they're all women, as it happens, and. Um, so 15 minutes every week I uh, meditate Buddhist style um, but I have to admit I don't do it that much at home um, what happens to me though is when I'm in a uh, young reading group like this and I'm conversing with people and saying things um, afterwards I have no idea what I've said in my conscious and my ego mind and so what normally happens I believe is that I literally engage myself and that cause what you are hearing are things that my self believes I'm not sure that my ego would agree and often um, when I look at the videos of these sessions afterward um, I sometimes say, oh, did I say that? And uh, I've had many occasions when we have been meeting down at uh, Sammy's Pizza Kitchen where um, I will go out of the place after two hours and I have no clue uh, what we've talked about or whether there's anything useful in the video that I've taken of the evening. And uh, very often I find truly profound things, not only from me, but from uh, my colleagues who uh, come with me. Uh, one of them called me today and said, well, I'm not so sure I'm uh, happy with the, the broadcast style because he doesn't want to speak live. He, he says, uh, uh, it's one thing when I know that you're going to edit it, so anything stupid that I say, <laughs> you let it out. Uh, I hope I've done that adequately over the year, but anyway. Um, so, Lishan says, so is there any specifically Jungian methods? Um, well, certainly um, there is Jungian analysis, and I have, I've never done Jungian analysis directly, and uh, I think that the uh, best thing that you can do, Lishan, is simply read the books and watch the videos um, because eventually those things will start to, um, to uh, get through to you and have meaning to you. And, um, and then... Um, you know, then it'll start to come into you in a normal way, um, not through a mental health professional uh, way. Um, and that's what I've done. And uh, I've found Dr. Young extremely helpful to me in many, many different uh, ways over the years. So I find that whenever I'm in psychic turmoil, if I pick up any Jungian book um, and start to read it, uh, it starts to soothe me. And I don't know why, I can't say why, it's a mystery, um, but it works for me. And so I think that, you know, I guess that's a kind of meditation where I'm picking up a Jungian book and 
um, meditating on something he said, and I and I can almost do it at random, um, and uh, it just makes me feel more comfortable. And I think it's the more comfortable part is myself because my ego might be up here in a turmoil, but myself is saying, "Yep, yeah, you know you're." you're communicating with me and that's what I care about. That's what the self says. Um, Nishan says, yes, Muslims say prayer, Islamic prayer is the only time heart is above the brain. Uh -huh, okay. Um, well, that makes, that does make sense. Um, and yeah, I, I'm sure that, you know, dietary practices uh, do also help. They're a kind of discipline. Um, you know, obviously in, in the Jewish religion there's kosher things and, and those uh, originally were because of sanitary uh, rules and they aren't so necessary today since we have uh, public health and we, uh, we no longer use wooden uh, plates, for example, where uh, disease was often bred. We use porcelain today or plastic. So uh, then when we wash them, we, we wash away anything that can uh, be contaminated. And, um, but uh, nonetheless, people of the Jewish faith uh, do follow those kosher rules still. And, and that's, that's, a, uh, that's a religious practice. It's, it's no longer necessary as a um, sanitary practice, which is how those things got going. Um, Imago Dei says, this holds true with Christian mysticism, practicing aesthetics felt a nearness with the divine. Um, my contention is that mindful hallucinations set in with the breakdown of the body. Um, and uh, I think you'll find that if you go back to the Dr. Edinger's uh, lecture, and before I hang up here, I'll put put the link on one more time on the chat so it's easier to find. Uh, but at the end of the uh, lecture, he's talking about death and the so-called conjunctio, and um, uh, you know he he's literally talking about issues like that. And Miles says, I was once attending a church when they had some sort of meditative evenings with candles, and it was quite mysterious, some sort of transcendence felt. Uh, I'm sure that's true. That's uh, the way Quakers are. Quakers, if you go to a Quaker meeting, everybody goes in and they just sit. They don't say anything normally. And then if they feel the Spirit move them, then anyone in the congregation can get up and and say something, and and I think that they are uh, feeling the spirit within themselves when they do that. Um, now let's see, it's 9.18, so we don't have much time, uh, but l let me take a crack at this. Um, I just I wanted to... Um, get started here um, on, on what uh, these uh, authors, um, I'm referring to Jung's Red Book for Our Time, and I've prepared um, Thomas Arst, uh, who's actually a physicist, um, I've prepared his uh, lecture um, or his essay, and um, I think I'll I'll play that for you, and then we can come back. So he's talking about um, uh, the Red Book and uh, and its relevance to our time. And in this uh, in this video, you'll um, see me. I'll I'll show the the big Red Book during this video, and. Um, and then uh, I'll give you the fir at least the first part of what Dr. Arst talks about here.
or two because I found some material about Dr. Young's Red Book that I think is very important and might be useful to you. You may not have heard of the Red Book, and so let me show you what it is. This is the folio version of the Red Book. And it's a huge volume, and there is a smaller volume, a reader's edition, but unfortunately it doesn't contain any of the prints, any of the folio prints uh, from Dr. Young's work. And just to give you an appreciation of what I'm talking about, Dr. Young wrote the passages of the Red Book in German Gothic script. So let me, <laughs> let me give you a sense of that. So the part that I want to read to you is that front page and this back page. And it's all written in, all handwritten in uh, Gothic manuscript style uh, by Dr. Jung himself. And these were then placed in a folio volume which sat beside Dr. Young's desk for many years, probably at least 40 years, if not more. And so those two pages, which I'm going to read to you in English, are the first two manuscript pages of what Dr. Young called Liber Primus. And the title of this section is called The Way of What is to Come. And the reason I'm stopping reading Ion for a couple of days while I read this to you is that this brief passage, written in 1915, really sums up a very central aspect of Dr. Jung's work, both the religious aspect and the idea of individuation, which go hand in hand in Dr. Jung's work. And it's quite remarkable to me, I've read this several times, many times, and gradually I've come to understand what it means. I'll try to help you with that as I read. But today, and for the next few days, I'm going to read a brief passage from this book, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. This is the first of several volumes of essays by Jungian analysts about the significance of the Red Book itself. And it seems a very useful book. It was only published in about October of 2017, and so it's quite new. But it has important passages about Dr. Jung's work. And so what I'm going to do is read an excerpt of uh, Dr. Arst's first essay, The Way of What is to Come, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions by Thomas Arst. Our age is seeking a new spring of life. I found one and drank of it, and the water tasted good. C.G. Jung. That quote is cited in C.G. Jung, The Red Book, Liber Nobis, edited by Sonu Shamdasani and translated by John Peck, Mark Kieberts, and Sonu Shamdasani, New York. Now then, it seems that I've, uh, I don't know what I've done here, but uh, I guess it's still playing, uh, so I'll resume it. Um, sorry about that. W. W. Norton, 2009, page 210. So what I'm going to do today is read a first excerpt of Dr. Arst's essay. I'll complete this excerpt in the next couple of days, and then I will go over and read those two pages of the folio version in the
translation of Dr. Jung's work itself. But I'm beginning with the essay by Thomas Arst. A specter haunts our world today. Its name is Angst. Small world. As former German Secretary of State Frank Walter Steinmeier recently remarked, the world is out of joint. At the same time, German diplomats such as Wolfgang Itzinger have noted that the disintegration of international security structures has accelerated and that decision makers in politics and business are overrun by unexpected events on a daily basis. Diagnosticians of our time, like German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk, see the world plunging forward. The World Economic Forum's Risk Report 2017 identifies a hazardous planetary risk landscape that does not invite for much cheerfulness and serenity. Our present age, which we may call postmodernity, is characterized by an overwhelming amount of fluidity and volatility on a global scale, as well as on the level of everyday lives of individuals. Cynical contemporaries even speak of a racing standstill. Although nothing remains the same, nothing substantial does in fact change. Even if we cannot yet see the direction in which this unbridled fast train engine called globalization will take us, today's world is obviously undergoing historical transformations that are probably unique in size and scale. Quote, pour vous que cela dure. If only this will work out well in the long run, unquote as Napoleon's mother remarked while witnessing the coronation of her son. In fact, there have always been turbulent thrusts, cracks, faults, and societal feverish states. Contemporary historians usually attribute these two exclusively to technological change and innovation. For example, if we consider the decade prior to the year 1914, as Philippe Blum's work, The Vertigo Years, Change in Culture in the West, 1900 to 1914, impressively shows, we find that the first 14 years of the 20th century saw rapid socioeconomic developments that put the individuals, as well as many European societies, into a highly agitated state. The spirit of this time, as C.G. Jung referred to it in his Red Book, the spirit of this time, as C.G. Jung referred to it in his Red Book, then led Europeans as though sleepwalking to exhausting trench warfare and technological mobilization, giving rise to geopolitical realignments. What is disconcerting is Blum's observation. Quote, then as now, rapid changes in technology, globalization, communication technologies, and changes in the social fabric dominated conversations and newspaper articles. Then as now, cultures of mass consumption stamped their mark on the time. Then as now, the feeling of living in an accelerated world of speeding into the unknown was overwhelming." Unquote. The tremors of World War I consequently led to World War II in our time, total mobilization has reached the planetary level, just one spiral turn higher. Once more, we are disoriented in an epoch of angst, and now 100 years after the age of anxiety, we find ourselves again restless in the age of burnout. Artists and sensitive contemporaries who lived between the years 1880 and 1914 such as the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, intuited the seismographic shift that was about to come. Bewildered by societal developments and generational world weariness, trapped in the prison of reason and yearning for an absent meaning, the best minds looked for new ways out of the spiritual malaise of their time. 
Dadaist Hugo Ball described the collective condition of his generation as follows, quote, the world and society in 1913 looked like this. Life is completely confined and shackled. A kind of economic fatalism prevails. Each individual, whether he resists it or not, is assigned to a specific role, and with it his interests and his character. The church is regarded as a redemption factory of little importance, literature as a safety valve. The most burning question day and night is, is there anywhere a force that is strong enough to put an end to this state of affairs? And if not, how can one escape it? End quote. God is dead, as Nietzsche announced, and the iron cage of modernity was, in the meantime, having turned into an omnipresent, digitalized gestel, rigidly established. Let me read that sentence without the parenthetical. God is dead, as Nietzsche announced, and the iron cage of modernity was rigidly established. Contemporaries sensed the severe implications of the erosion of the Christian myth, not to be at home in one's own time anymore. Then as now, the collective situation forced the search for transcendence and meaning in order to withstand the undertow of the postmodern chaos that has undoubtedly revealed a nihilistic signature. The Swiss psychologist C.G. Jung undertook perhaps the most challenging deep dive to seek answers to the questions posed by the epic. Alarmed by visions and dreams which reflected the tensions of his era and presaged the coming world war, Jung daringly searched for his soul in an experiment to learn his personal myth. After the descent, Jung not only formulated his own myth, but was also able to suggest the framework for a new collective myth. As will be illustrated later, Jung's Red Book, Liber Novus, is both a highly intimate testimonial and a reference to the framework of this new collective myth. <laughs> okay, well, I have a, have a, a theory uh, that I've been working on for nearly 20 years now. Um, I, um, in the early 2000s, I was doing a lot of traveling around the world um, and talking to people from uh, many, many different countries. And I would always, when I had an opportunity, ask people, uh, what one factor above all other factors makes the United States the strongest country in the world and the most powerful fi financially in the world? And that's really a stump the stars question, as you might guess. You might be thinking that even now. And... It finally came to me that the, um, the secret sauce of the United States is our diversity, because uh, what happens in our system, when I'm talking about the, the process of the American system over 400 years, is that whenever a good idea uh, comes up from any group, uh, it gets adopted by everybody. Whenever a bad idea comes up, it gets pummeled out of the system by vigorous debate and sometimes by violence, as we had in the American Civil War. Um, but mostly we've been able to do it as a, as a public process of debate. We obviously are seeing our national neurosis play out on the cable channels every night <laughs> for the last several years and um, <clears throat> but 
those processes, uh, ultimately we're going to mature out of that, for example. And 10 years from now, we'll look back on this time and um, we won't <clears throat> we won't have cured the neurosis, but we will have matured beyond it. And um, the reason this gives us an advantage is because other countries where other ideas are not allowed um, don't have the benefit of good ideas. And the irony is I, I've done a lot of travel in Saudi Arabia working in the healthcare industry. And in King Faisal Hospital, as an example, which is, um, it's now the second leading hospital in the kingdom, but, but when I started, it was number one. Um, but that building, which is on a hundred acre campus, has four, um, four Starbucks cafes in the building. So that's a an American uh, good idea that got adopted everywhere. You can go anywhere in the Muslim world and find Starbucks. And the irony is that Starbucks is owned and uh, the chairman of Starbucks is a known Zionist. Um, and so, um, you know, and even if someone were to hear me mention this now and not know it and then go get all the Starbucks franchises taken away, uh, still uh, people would be buying coffee the way they do at Starbucks, maybe with a different name, who knows. And um, so, but that's just an example of so many ideas that just go around the world and uh, the good ones get adopted. And now it's, a, it's an international uh, process and functionality. It wasn't before. I mean, uh, the United States was pretty isolated until at least after World War II. And so our process was going on here in North America, uh, but it wasn't going on around the world. But now um, it is. So now, th thanks to the internet, which has opened up a sort of a circulatory system of ideas, um, now we see people adopting uh, ideas from America all the time, good ones. Uh, obviously, they laugh at us for our bad ones and for our bad neurosis, um, but um, they're also going to see that we ultimately grow out of uh, our neurosis. Um, Winston Churchill uh, once said, um, Americans always get the right answer after trying everything else. And uh, that's pretty much the way we do it, but it's a system that works. And, uh, and countries that uh, don't allow cross-fertilization of ideas and, and keep people under wraps in various ways uh, don't have the benefit of, of that, and therefore uh, they get left behind. And uh, so I think that there is a process uh, that individuation is related to. All of us are part of the process, and all of us have our uh, mosaic piece that we can put into the, um, into the postmodern situation. But the reality is, it seems to me that that process is what's going on around the world. And um, I think that Edinger's um, uh, comments about uh, what Dr. Jung was able to perceive about religion, uh, if you read, read and listen to that uh, interview in detail, um, I think you'll th believe it's profound. I mean, he, he was saying that uh, Dr. Jung was talking uh, from a consciousness that none of us have, and he gave as examples of other people who were way ahead in, co in consciousness, Jesus Christ and uh, the Buddha. 
uh, and um, both of them had achieved a higher level of consciousness uh, than the people around them and uh, and that's why they're remembered because of that and as I look at Dr. Young's work and listen to Dr. Edinger talk about it and write about it um, I think he's definitely right about that and uh, you know obviously I <laughs> I believe that because I think I uh, put up my 556th video on this YouTube channel uh, today and and this uh, session will be the 557th uh, so obviously I believe it but as others are exposed to it uh, I think that they too will see that uh, these ideas are good ones and um, and you know, in terms of religion, um, you know, we keep killing one another over religion, but, you know, if we just turn that around and say, what can we learn from the other religions about ourselves, about the self, uh, as it is manifesting in their part of the world, maybe we'll learn something about ourself in the process. Um, that's not a bad thing uh, and you know certainly I've had that experience as I've uh, traveled in um, the Middle East uh, very extensively I've been to Saudi Arabia 23 times and uh, since 2002 so since 9-11 I've been to Saudi Arabia 23 times and uh, so I know something about uh, what it's like to live in those environments and uh, we do have things that we can learn uh, from their uh, society and uh, that's just a personal opinion but uh, let's see Miles uh, well, says I think we have been hijacked by the psychopaths the soul killers have us brainwashed to be consumers of what they sell well that's uh, uh, certainly true, and uh, I learned quite a long time ago that, you know, you can aspire to have a Maserati in your uh, driveway, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a driving aspiration why you have it as an aspiration, but as soon as you have it uh, and it's in your driveway, then it needs uh, new tires and, and oil changes, just like any other car. Um, and... Uh, maybe you'd be embarrassed to have it. I mean, I, I had a red Corvette uh, for about five years, and for a year and a half I kept it in my garage because I didn't want my staff to realize that I had a red Corvette. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, just because you have, a, have something material uh, doesn't mean that that it's the end-all be-all for you but I didn't know that until I had the red Corvette that I said mm, maybe this is not such a good idea to drive this to work um, well you can say let's see Clark says well you can say that but in Korea that's what it's actually like no symbology just the leader kills your family if you do something wrong well uh, that's obviously a problem part of humanity uh, there and um, uh, I don't think that that family will be in power uh, forever um, you know there's a famous uh, Gandhi quote which is uh, uh, that um, there have been tyrants and for a time they can seem very powerful but in the end they all fall think of it always that's what he said uh, that's a quote that was in the movie and so um, you know I think things could also change in North Korea you know we see tiny little signs of it from the Olympics um, and it's going to it remains to be seen what will happen with this uh, purported meeting with the president uh, but it's going to be at a very interesting time there. So, um, 
yes, there are societies like that. I, um, I participated in a play with friends of mine uh, from Turkey. It was a Turkish play, and um, I was playing the Twitter Greek chorus, believe it or not. And um, what I didn't know uh, at the time was that they were projecting my Twitter feed on the wall of the theater. Um, and we did this 25 times. Uh, it was uh, all the performances were in Istanbul. And uh, I actually was physically present on the premises one time. Uh, and the play closed on April 14th, uh, 2013. And um, one month later, or no, two months later, uh, the cast and crew of that play were accused of attempting to foist a revolution in Turkey. And uh, ultimately they became exiles and live outside of Turkey today. Um, and so if you, um, if you want to um, see, um, you can see my story of that if you look under the category questions uh, on the Archetype in Action website. I wrote a, a long story about it at one point. Um, let's see, Miles says USA used to stand for freedom, but now has anyone found the missing 2.5 trillion? Rumsfeld said he was going to find the day before 9-11 and the accounting area of the Pentagon was hit. Uh, well, you know, we have a lot of things going on in our financial industry and, um, you know, funny business in uh, our defense industry too. That's, those are obviously uh, major problems and we have to expose those things. I mean, the thing that I find shocking is that the uh, defense budget uh, before 9-11 was around $350 billion, uh, but now it's uh, more than double that, and there hasn't been any noticeable change in our uh, normal combat power. Uh, and yes, we have added Cyber Command and Space Command, and I think most Americans have no clue uh, what those two organizations do. I mean, uh, my mother-in-law says, oh my God, the Russians have access to our electrical grid. Well, uh, yeah, we have, we no doubt have access to theirs as well, and I'm sure they know it. And uh, so this is a um, continuing on with the Cold War. Um, but those trillions, yeah, yeah, but they're funny money. I mean, and um, what people don't realize is the reason for the crash of 2008 was that the, um, the financial industry ran an inflation off the books that uh, the Fed would see. Uh, in other words, they created an alternate currency in the form of um, inflated mortgage-backed securities. And so the reason the Fed hasn't been, hasn't been able to get the economy going since 2008, even though they were giving money away, is that there was this huge deflation that occurred off the books of the Fed um, in that uh, mortgage-backed securities industry. And that had to be digested uh, before uh, the Fed's normal methods of doing things uh, could have any effect at all. In fact, there's doubt that it has effect even today. I'm not sure it does. Um, Nichol, uh, Clark Nichols says, what worries me is that we limit our acceptable space of dialogue. Uh, well, we certainly do that. I mean... Um, Nowadays, we don't even uh, really get too many experts 
And when we get an expert, we then sometimes step on what they are saying. Uh, for example, the other night, uh, Lawrence O'Brien was going to interview uh, General Barry McCaffrey, who uh, was, a, is a four, was a four-star general, and I think he was the head of NATO at one point, uh, NATO command. And he started to make some comments about the president, and boom, he was, it was like... Uh, Somebody had the shepherd's crook and pulled him off the stage. And, I, you know, I kept watching the whole rest of the hour to see if they brought him back, and they didn't. Instead, they, um, they stuck with uh, Stormy Daniels' story and the McCabe story. And so uh, you can be pretty sure that any time uh, the cable news is sticking some salacious uh, sexual story uh, on the news, they're covering something that we ought to know about. Um, but also, Clark, I will say that, you know, sometimes we, some of us do know, and we start to pass the word, and, you know, that, that is, uh, going to happen more. I'm, I'm not going to say more about it right now, but I'm working on something that will be about that, about the financial industry. Um, what worries me? Okay. Miles says, Clark, that's true. We need to get back to town halls and General Henry Martin Robert and his parliamentary rules of order. Uh, yeah, that's really not how things are decided, unfortunately, Miles. Uh, you know, people are saying uh, on our current TV, oh my God, the president is going to, uh, is impeaching the veracity of McCabe for purposes of uh, testimony against him. And... Uh, you know, I, I just sort of giggle and remember the scene from Witness where um, Harrison Ford uh, is asked, well, how is Samuel going to be safe at trial? And Harrison Ford looks into the camera and he says, there isn't going to be a trial. And there isn't going to be an impeachment procedure either. Um, and I'll say that clearly and emphatically, that that's my prediction, that there will be neither one. Um, it's, it's not to say that uh, Mr. Mr. Trump won't leave office sometime soon, but uh, it will be done uh, in the same way that Richard Nixon left, which was uh, some people came from Capitol Hill. I'm not saying they'll come from Capitol Hill this time but say, some people came in and, and talked to Richard Nixon and the next day he resigned. And that's what's going to happen here too. Um, whatever we repress just comes back stronger. It seeps into everything. Yes, uh, we are the jungle creepers, okay? <laughs> I definitely am. <laughs> and uh, well, so there's a lot of funny money because banks can now make 20000 if you deposit $1,000. Uh, well, they can re make a lot more than that. I mean, um, it's, it's just egregious uh, what happened after 2008. And um, the money that was made um, is just, just beyond... Um, or who was the king that turned his daughter into gold. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's happening. And so, okay, uh, Leishan says, or like JFK. Uh, yeah, like JFK too. Um, that's, a, that's another way that it happens. And um, so, I mean... For me, uh, doing the the young channel is in a way um, a way to plant seeds around the world that work like 
jungle creepers. I don't have to take any specific political position anywhere in the world because once people start to study Jung and start to understand the significance of some of the things that he said, um, then uh, things will change. Things are changing. And, you know, as Edinger said very clearly in his interview, uh, one man has done it. And once one man has done it, uh, then, yeah, you know, you can't unring the bell. It can't be changed. Um, and so I do expect that to be the consequence of, um, well, you know, I'm confident that I will have and do have um, uh, effects on um, the collective unconscious. Uh, there's a good documentary by Adam Curtis called Hypernormalization that everyone should check out. He previously made the documentary Century of the Self. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there are those in the powers that be uh, that would like to have a dumbed down population uh, that can only uh, do relatively menial tasks while they um, harvest the results of everyone's work. And uh, that's sort of the brave new world scenario or whatever. Um, and yes, I think that there are people like that in the world, um, but ultimately I think they will fail because uh, if the United States, you know, if the United States doesn't have enough technology people, for example, and China or Russia or Japan starts to get ahead of us again, or Europe, um, then I think there'll be a great rush again to train people up. I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember Sputnik and how uh, once Sputnik was up in the sky, all of a sudden the, the government made changes. And so, you know, all of these things operate by this concept of enantiodromia uh, that Dr. Jung uh, talked about, which is, okay, they can get pretty extreme. And certainly in the United States, we've seen uh, extremes in our politics. But when they get extreme, then they tend to start turning into their opposites. And uh, so I've seen um, the South change from Democratic to Republican in my lifetime. And uh, it may start to change back to democratic, who knows? Um, you know, certainly I think we've seen things in the last uh, couple of years that suggest that American uh, political attitudes are uh, moderating, let's say. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's slow. You have to be sensitive to realize it's happening. Um, but that concept of enantiodromia does work, which is the idea of things tending to turn into their opposite. And so, anyway, uh, okay, we've had a nice chat here. Um, if, um, if you have any burning questions right now, by the way, um, it turns out I have a meeting with my doctor on Thursday, so I'm not going to be able to do uh, my answer to Job Q&A on Thursday as I normally do. I am going to do it on Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Uh, that'll be announced probably tomorrow morning because once I get off, uh, excuse me, once I get off one of these live streams, it takes a few hours for the system to reset. Uh, but I'll probably announce it tomorrow morning. And uh, if you have been following our um, Answer to Job series, uh, it will be uh, Wednesday at 1.30. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, and uh, 
It's been great to talk to you, but it's now 10 p.m., uh, so I'm going to sign off with all due respect to everyone. I really appreciate you being here, and uh, we'll talk some more. If you have specific ideas or play things that within the Jungian oeuvre that you'd like to talk about in these sessions, um, I'm not sure that my local reading group is going to go back into Sammy's. They may do, uh, but um, the last two weeks were the first two weeks in two years that none of them have physically come here. Uh, so uh, whether I'll have a reading group at Sammy's in the future, I don't know, but it seems clear uh, from my experiences here using live stream uh, that there is a group of people around the world who do have interest in this and so I will continue to try to run my reading group um, through the live stream method uh, and so next week again it will be uh, 8 p.m. next Monday that's our normal time and uh, at least we will do it this way next time. I, I, I'll find out Thursday whether I'm going to be able to drive to go to Sammy's in the future. But anyway, peace. Take care. I'm signing off.